if you've been here for the last three weeks, we've been in a series without even knowing that we're in a series. I love when the Lord does that. Uh, my dad and I talked, and we were like, hey, we have this series we feel like the Lord's put in our hearts called Harvest and Holy Spirit. And I sort of just sort of talked about it with Wesley and Nikki, but didn't fully know like what was going to come out. Well, the last three weeks have already been in the middle of it. Because we've been talking about Harvest and Holy Spirit. And so this is what we're, what we're going to be in. And I just want to lay a little bit of groundwork here because um, we're going to be in this series until Vision Sunday on November 12th. And the reason we're doing that is because one of the biggest aspects of Vision 2024 is living on mission, on assignment to see a city transformed. What does that look like? It sounds big, doesn't it? Whoa, cities. But the Lord has practical things for each of us in this. And so we're going to step into harvest and Holy Spirit. And I'm going to kind of kick this off this morning, even though we've already been in the middle of it, and we're going to continue to share a lot more on this. But can we just pray? Can you just put your arms open? Lord, we just love you. We thank you that we've gotten the opportunity all morning just to lavish our oil on you. To pour out our oil, to pour out our love upon you. Because there's no greater calling than to get to pour my love on him. And so I ask, Holy Spirit, that you would move this morning. I thank you for your power, for your authority. We give you this whole time. We give you the room. We give you our hearts. I ask even that as we're, as we're talking about this, that you would stir us up for what you have. Stir hearts in the room. Awaken us, Lord. We give everything to you this morning because it's all yours. I ask you that you would mark hearts. That you would mark hearts. That the fire of the Holy Spirit would come. We're not here for a good teaching time. We're here to meet with you as we are for this entire time. We love you. We love you. Just tell him that you love him. We love you, Jesus. In Jesus' name, everyone said, amen. Amen. All right. Matthew 9. How many were here for Wesley's message last week? Oh, man, that is not very many of you. <laughs> Go back and catch the podcast if you were not here. Wesley kicked us off in Matthew 9. So we're going to look at verse 37. By the way, you should have your Bible with you. Amen? We love our Bibles here at Convergence. We believe in the Spirit and the Word. All right, so Matthew 9, 37. Then he said to his disciples... The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Therefore, plead with the Lord of the harvest. Another translation says beseech. Therefore, plead with the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into his harvest. A couple of things here real quick. Wesley already talked about this. I love how it says into his harvest. It's not my harvest. Which also means that when he sends me out, it's not just my thing, it's I'm doing it on behalf of him. This phrase, Lord of the harvest, I read a commentary this week that said that actually could be an Aramaic phrase that means chief harvester. So think about that. Plead with the chief harvester. That's not me. Oh, come on. How does that change what harvest looks like. It's not my responsibility to bring in the harvest. It's my responsibility to go. And he brings in the harvest. John 12, Jesus says, I will draw all men to myself. I don't know about you, but I don't want to draw all men to me. 
I don't want to draw all men to a marketing brand. I don't want to draw all men to Convergence Church as, that's just a, it's just a church. I'm not drawing them to this building. I'm drawing them to Jesus because Jesus is drawing them. And he wants to encounter them. And so when, when we read this verse, plead with the chief harvester to send out workers, not into my harvest, not into Convergence Church's harvest, into his harvest. So what does harvest mean? Uh, Jesus is using this. I love Jesus commonly uses figurative language here. He's representing here a readiness now for people to respond to the gospel. Do you think that people want to respond to the gospel right now? Do you think that we need to wait for the right moment for people to respond to the gospel? I believe that harvest in the kingdom isn't meant to just be one season, but, it's meant, but we are meant to live harvest-minded. We're meant to live harvest-minded. I think sometimes in the church, I've grown guilty to this, where it's like we kind of have seasons of revival. Well, it's a season of harvest, and the Lord does place deeper emphasis in certain seasons on things. But when I read my Bible, I see that every single day I am called to preach the gospel, to see people come into the harvest and not wait for a particular time in history when I think that now everybody in the church is finally on board to go after the harvest. Then Wesley brought us into Matthew 10. Matthew 10, 1 starts out, and Jesus gives them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal every kind of disease and every kind of sickness. Then we skip down here to verse 5 where it says, These 12 Jesus sent out. So Jesus says, I'm sending workers, and then he says, I'm sending you. So this morning... Don't think of workers as other people that are not Convergence Church. Workers is you. He's sending you. He's sending me. He instructs them saying, do not go on a road to Gentiles. So again, right now, he's called them to the Jews. And do not enter a city of Samaritans, but rather go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And as you go, preach saying, the kingdom of heaven has come near. Heal the sick Raise the dead, cleanse those with leprosy, cast out demons. Freely you received, freely give. As you have received, give it out. All right, so how does the Holy Spirit fit into this? If you have your Bible, can you turn with me to Acts 1, verse 8. Acts 1, verse 8. Jesus, right before he ascends to the Father, this is what he says. But you will receive what? It doesn't say a little bit of power. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my what? Witnesses, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria, and even to the remotest part of the earth. This verse does not say, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you for yourself. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you to, to do your own life and do your own thing. It says, but you will receive power unto being a witness. So the power that is within me is not just for me. It's for those around me. It's for every eye to see Jesus. And every tongue to confess that he is Lord. The Holy Spirit has put power inside of me so that all the earth, I love that song, all the earth will shout your praise. Hearts will cry. Great are you, Lord. Every part of me would see that happen through the power of the Holy Spirit. So you cannot have the harvest without the Holy Spirit. It's harvest and Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit empowers you to be a witness. 
The harvest is not something we just have dreams about seeing. The harvest is not something we look towards in the future. The harvest is not something we wait for someone else to finally say it's time. Jesus already told the disciples it's time. And what I believe is happening right now, and I love when I was talking to Mario, he was telling me about Gen Z for Jesus. And this, this was an event that they had last Saturday in L.A., thousands. Gary was there. Gary's team was a part of that. So good to see Gary, Cheryl here. We love you guys. Gary's team was helping produce that event. And there's probably like 5,000 Gen Z in Los Angeles, California, crying out to Jesus to see revival in their generation. I don't know about you, but when you see that, your heart can't go. It's time. Don't wait for the harvest. Step in. It's time. What the Lord is doing in Gen Z stirs my heart. But listen, it is not just Gen Z. It's every generation. Every single one of us have a call to the harvest. We have a call to cry out for more. We have a cry to say, I want to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. I want to see it. But part of seeing it is, I will go. I will be part of it. Uh, my heart is so stirred for what the Lord is doing to see a city transformed. And I love what Wesley and Nikki brought the last few weeks. Um, they really launched us into this. And even when Nikki was talking about the fields, how many were here for that message? Go back and listen. If you were not here, man, that's not very many hands. Go back and listen. She talked about the fields. And one thing she mentioned, and Nikki did such an amazing job of, of just releasing this, she mentioned the simplicity of just following the Father's leading. I love that. Why do we overcomplicate it? What is the Lord asking me to do? And go do it. Let him lead you. Following him will lead you where you need to go. Nikki did such an amazing job carrying that. And I love that too because that's what Jesus said. He made things really simple. What did he tell his disciples? Follow me. But then what's the second part? And who will make them fishers of men? He will. I don't have to learn how to be a fisher of men apart from just on my own. I learn as I follow him. He will make you fishers of men. And so here's what I want to really pour into today. I want to talk about living on assignment. And so no matter what you are doing, you are called to make disciples. No matter what you are doing, you have authority to cast out demons, heal every kind of disease, and every sickness. No matter what you are doing, you are called to give out what you have received. You have the power of the Holy Spirit within you so that we can give it away. You don't have power within you for it to stay within you. It needs to come out. And this is what harvest looks like with the Holy Spirit. So I want to talk about two types of assignments. Two types of assignments. The first assignment is assignment for all. When I read the Bible, I see a lot of, I see a lot of passages where there's assignments given to everybody. For example, everybody is called to heal the sick. Not just the evangelist, not just the pastor on stage, not just the crusade, not just the stadium gathering. You were called to heal the sick. Oh, man. I'm not sure we're here this morning. Am I talking to a people that know that the Jesus in them wants to heal people around them? All right. We're going to cast out demons. Come on, we need to see some demons cast out. So there's assignments to all. The Great Commission is one of those. Wesley talked about that. The Great Commission, it doesn't say, now go all ye therefore, all pastors and ministers on full-time staff at a church to make disciples. Is that what it says? That's not what my Bible says. If yours does, you need to get a new translation. Go all and make disciples of all nations. There's not a, there's not a, like, okay, but we're going to look at the footnotes and see who's he really talking about. He's talking about you. He's talking about me. 
He's talking about Convergence Church in Fort Worth, Texas. We're going to go, and we're going to make disciples of all nations. So there's assignments for all of us. Assignments for all is that we all have a mandate within whatever we are doing to be light. We have a mandate to love those around us, and we have a mandate to make disciples. All of us have that call. If you think that that's not you, that's you. All of us are called to bring light into places of darkness. All of us are called to love those around us. All of us are called to cast out evil spirits. It's not just for the radical Christians. Radical Christians. I looked. I did, I did a study. I looked for the word radical. It's not there. You can't find it. It's not in the Bible. You know what else is not in the Bible? Super Christian. It's not in the Bible. There's not Christians that, have their, that, that are more super or more radical, and so all, we're like, oh, we're going to leave it to them. We're going to leave that to them because they're walking in it. Look at what they're doing. There's no way I can do that. And sometimes we think when it comes to this overall assignment, that we have this thing that's like, that's just for the evangelist, pastors, and apostles. We have this extreme sometimes, I think, where we seem to have people that we consider radical Christians and we put them on a pedestal. We elevate them. And then in some ways we disqualify ourselves because we're not seeing the same things happen. Can I tell you something? What we call extreme should be normal. There is no radical Christian. There is no super Christian. There is no, you're a little bit more called than someone else. What I see in my Bible is that every single person is a radical Christian. You're called to live a lifestyle of power and authority through the Holy Spirit. You're called to see the the sick raised. You're called to see demons cast out. You're called to see it. Your life should provoke darkness. Not just some people's lives. Not just those that have a ministry. Not just those that have a YouTube channel. Not just those that are preaching in stadiums. Whatever you're called to in this room, you are called to see the power and the authority of the Holy Spirit come out in a tangible way. It's time that we get rid of this thing that says some are called. Oh, I just, I just don't know enough of the Bible. Oh, I just haven't seen that happen yet. Go do it, and I guarantee you you're going to see it happen. <laughs> I remember the first time I was learning how to prophesy. I was probably doing a not-so-great job, right? I, I needed Nikki's class. And I remember... My friend and I, we were at Pizza Inn, and we were just like, Lord, what do you want to do? And we're like, we're just going, and we're hanging out at Pizza Inn. And all of a sudden, the Lord begins to download words, and we probably prophesied over six people at Pizza Inn. Why? Because we just had this mandate. We were like, we're going to go eat pizza, but it's not just about pizza. It's about what is the Holy Spirit doing? What is he doing while I'm eating pizza? What is he doing? So can I tell you something? This is living the Christian life. So every one of us, when it comes to the harvest, has a call to walk in this assignment. We're all called to this, okay? Now, I want to dive into the second type of assignment. Within this assignment, though... There's also specific assignments given to specific individuals. We see this all throughout scripture, right? Jonah was called to Nineveh, and he didn't want to go, right? We know the story. Moses is called to lead the Israelites out of Egypt. He didn't call someone else. He called Moses. Esther was called to be queen and to be in an influential position to save the Jews. That's Esther 4.14. 
All throughout scripture, we have prophets assigned to release specific words to Israel at specific times throughout the Old Testament. We have Paul, before it was cool, before it was cool, called to go preach to the Gentiles. In fact, so before it was cool, they were like, whoa, Paul, I, we need to have a council about this. Because I'm not sure this is right. Right? Right? God calls Paul to preach to the Gentiles at a time that, that was forerunner. He was stepping into a specific assignment that God had for him, and it was going to open up something for all of the Gentiles. And then we have Jesus, a specific assignment to come to the earth to be a man just like me, to have emotions. To die on a cross, rise again, ascend to the Father in order that we could be closer to him, walk with him, have full access, freedom, and live with him forever. And guess what? He fulfilled his assignment. So there's different assignments. There's assignments given to everybody, and then there's, Lord, there, there's a specific assignment that the Lord also gives specific individuals to go reach a specific nation, a specific place. There's specific things, okay? So these two go hand in hand. Your specific assignment is unto your main assignment. And here's what I want to say this morning. Every assignment is important. If you leave here with nothing else, leave here with this. Every assignment is important. Regardless of where you are right now or what you are doing, you are called to make his name known. All right, if you have your Bible, I want you to turn to John 4. We're going to spend the rest of the service in John 4. This is Jesus and the Samaritan woman. So we're going to start here. We can start in verse 6 or verse 5. So he came to a city of Samaria called Sychar, near the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. And Jacob's well was there. So Jesus, being weary, that's a good verse. Fully man and fully God, right? Jesus was weary from his journey and was sitting thus by the well and it says it was about the sixth hour. Verse 7, there came a woman of Samaria to draw water. And Jesus said to her, give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. Therefore the Samaritan woman said to him, how is it that you being a Jew ask me for a drink since I am a Samaritan woman? And my Bible has parentheses. It says, for Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered and said to her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. She said to him, sir, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where then do you get that living water? I love this. Such a practical question. Verse 12, you are not greater than our father Jacob, are you, who gave us this well and drank of it himself and his sons and his cattle? Verse 13, Jesus answered and said to her, everyone who drinks of this water will thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him shall never thirst. But the water that I will give him will become in him a well of water springing up to eternal life. Jesus in a roundabout way here is doing what? Presenting the gospel. Look, you can, you can go look for that other water. You can look for that other water, but you're always going to have to keep coming back for that water. But if you look to me, to the living water, you'll have eternal life. And so, of course, the woman says, Sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty nor come all the way here to draw. And he said to her, Go, call your husband and come here. And the woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, you have correctly said, I have no husband, for you have had five husbands, 
and the one whom you have now is not your husband. This you have said truly. Jesus reads her mail, right? The woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped in this mountain, and your people say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, an hour is coming when neither in this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But an hour is coming, and now is, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For such people the Father seeks to be his worshipers. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. Verse 25, the woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, he who is called Christ. When that one comes, he will declare all things to us. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. What a moment. Look, this is what's been prophesied. Yeah, you're right. It's happening now. I am he. I love that. Verse 27, at this point his disciples came and they were amazed that he had been speaking with a woman. Yet no one said, what do you seek or why do you speak with her? So the woman left her water pot, I love this, and went into the city and said to the men, come, see a man who told me all the things I have done. This is not the Christ, is it? They went out of the city and were coming to him. So they're coming to him. Meanwhile, the disciples were urging him, saying, Rabbi, eat. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you do not know about. So the disciples were saying to one another, no one brought him anything to eat, did he? Jesus said to them, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. Do you not say there are yet four months and then comes the harvest? Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields. They are white for harvest. Jesus is, they're like, in four months, it's, it's harvest time, right? And Jesus is like, look upon, the harvest is now. I love this story. We just read 35 verses of scripture. And what I love with this is revival in Samaria started with three things. A well, a word, and a woman. If I were Jesus, I would have done this differently. I would have gotten the band together. I would have brought our altar ministry team. We would have gone into the center of Samaria, and we would have invited everybody, and we would have said, hey, come to our uh, awakening service. Right? Let's do a crusade. Let's, let's do a big event. Now, I'm not knocking big events. Please understand, okay? Okay. I love big events, but I want you to see how practical this is. Jesus is sitting weary at a well, and a woman comes to draw water, and instead of just letting her draw water and leave, he engages her in conversation knowing this woman is the key to revival in Samaria. He didn't wait for a large service. He didn't He didn't teach to 5,000 in this moment. It was a well, a word, and it was a woman. And that one woman, see, sometimes we miss this. We think we we have to do big. It's got to be big. Bigger is better. One woman brings the whole city to Jesus to see him because Jesus had one conversation Wearied as he was with a woman at a well, he delivers a word. She sees him for who he is. She encounters Jesus, and an entire city is transformed, and we didn't have to have a huge meeting to do it. One woman. I want you to see how practical this is. Sometimes it's easy to get caught in thinking we aren't doing anything significant for the Lord because we aren't preaching to thousands or doing stadium gatherings. Or we're not talking to enough people. We're not on staff at a church. We're not on an international missions trip. It can feel like the thing we are doing is so insignificant that it really isn't making a difference. 
Then we see others doing what we consider bigger things with bigger platforms, and we feel insignificant. And I want you to see the significance in what you're doing. I read a great book. Uh, It's a good leadership book. And it's called The Four Obsessions of an Extraordinary Leader. It's a great leadership book. Not at all, has nothing to do with Jesus or anything, so just real practical leadership. But in the book, he tells this great story. And he talks about a time when President Lyndon B. Johnson went to visit the NASA Space Center in Houston. And the president walks in, and he sees this janitor. And this janitor, I can picture him, he's probably just going to town with the mop, right? He's just, he's doing, he's being a janitor. He's, he's making sure the place is clean. And it, it must have looked good because the president actually complimented him on it. He was like, man, you're, you're being a really good janitor. And this is what the janitor said. The janitor looks back at him. And he goes, I'm not a janitor. I put a man on the moon. Oh, a lot of you missed that. You missed it. Think about the assignment that the Lord has given you. There's moms in this room. There's creatives in this room. There's business people. There's there's teachers in this room. There's students in this room. And sometimes we can feel like what we're doing is so insignificant that we don't know how to grapple it into the vision. We don't see ourselves as getting into the vision. And what I want to see in this story is that this janitor didn't think his job was just sweeping floors. This janitor thought his job was that I actually put a man on the moon. I actually saw a city transformed. I actually saw revival happen just because I was teaching students in my classroom. I saw something happen, and this janitor grabs a hold of vision that's way bigger than sweeping floors. Catch this. By walking in your assignment and then stepping out to have a conversation, talk about Jesus, love people like Jesus called him to, you are owning your well, stepping out with a word, and being intentional with the one. You are part of the harvest. We overcomplicate this thing. We overcomplicate it. By investing in your kids, you are part of the harvest. By talking to the person in Walmart, sharing the love of Jesus, you are part of the harvest. By having a conversation about Jesus with a coworker, you are part of the harvest. By teaching kids in school and being able to reveal the love of Jesus and the love of the gospel, you are part of the harvest. By creating art, media, dance, and doing it for the Lord to allow his light to come through, you are part of the harvest. One of the biggest lies that I believe the church has bought into is that bigger is better. That revival only looks like a specific thing. We actually disqualify ourselves from the harvest because we put revival and harvest in a box. The more people in a room is always better than a few. The more influence means I'm doing more for the kingdom. That quantity equals revival. If lots of, listen to this, if lots of people aren't getting saved or set free in a service, then revival isn't here. And we put revival in this box, and we've made it look like specific things. And I love when the Lord pours out such a heavy movement where there are lots of people getting saved and set free. But I want you to see that is not the only thing revival looks like. It's not the only thing that harvest looks like. I love Billy Graham, and I love that his mantle was to preach to thousands. But what if your mantle right now, what if your assignment right now is to teach kids in your classroom? And what if that's just as powerful of a harvest as preaching to 10,000? Can we take things off a pedestal? 
Listen to this. You will find no passage in Scripture that says revival and the power of the Holy Spirit only moves in church buildings and large stadium gatherings. It's not there. What you see is Jesus going to the one. What you see is Paul in the book of Acts going to the one, going to a city, talking to a person, and something shifts. Woo, I can feel it. It sounds silly, but the reality is we buy into this, and this is what it does. It cripples us from moving into the harvest right now. Because we think the harvest looks like that. We disqualify ourselves and think, ah, I mean, I'm just a mom in this season. How can I step into the harvest right now because I'm just a mom? And what I want to tell you this morning, it, for all the moms and dads in the room, that the, one of the greatest assignments that God could ever give is family. Raising world changers, raising up kids in the way that they should go, and pouring that out on a generation, you are just as much as part of the harvest as someone that's up here with a microphone. Woo. So as we continue this and we head into 2024, I want to tell you, church, we are stepping into a greater level of a church family of harvest through the power of the Holy Spirit. So again, let's go back to John 4. A well, a word, and a woman. A place, the gospel, or your testimony, because your testimony does what? Reveals Jesus. So the gospel, your testimony, and a person. How simple is that? Your assignment in this season is important, and it's important to know that your assignment may be as simple as a well, a word, and a man or a woman. I delivered this word a few weeks ago, but the Lord has this burning thing in my heart right now for, for creatives, that the Lord is raising up an army of creatives, dancers, artists, musicians, worshipers. And I feel this thing burning in me that as you create before the Lord, you're part of the harvest. When you worship before the Lord like David did without caring, you are stepping into the harvest. Business owners, you're part of the harvest. Teachers and students, you're part of the harvest. Every single one of us have a specific assignment. And I believe this morning that one of the things that the Lord wants to do as we begin to land the plane is the Lord wants to do two things. One, he wants to renew and refresh those who feel weary in their assignment. But the second is this. The Lord wants to give fresh assignment. Fresh assignment. I remember... For some that step into this church and maybe you're new here, you see me up here, but you don't know my story. You don't know that I, I didn't want to do this initially. I've been a pastor's kid my whole life. Grew up in the church. Grew up going to conferences. Grew up going to Acquire the Fire. Who remembers that? Blast from the past. There's my Acquire the Fire people. Going to Acquire the Fire and jumping in the church van and going. Growing up in youth group, I even, <laughs> I even at one point, I, I bought a domain and I started to build a website called On Fire for God because my heart was burning so much. I was just like, I'm going to just put this out. I don't, I don't even know what it had on it, to be honest. <laughs> Building it on Microsoft front page, that's the OG. Anyway, the Lord was just putting this thing within me, but I didn't know what it was unto, and then... <clears throat> um, I went to all these things. I knew the Lord, but I didn't actually know how to walk with him. I didn't know how to hear his voice, and I for sure didn't know what my assignment was. And then all of a sudden, one time on an afternoon, I was standing in what is now Wesley's office, up here, upstairs. I was standing with a couple other guys. We were praying. And one of the lies that the Lord had told me, that the enemy had told me all my life, was that I... I didn't 
want to do full-time ministry. And I remember being up in this top room up here, and I just remember the Lord saying, you're called to full-time ministry. You're called to bring people into the kingdom. You're called to preach. You're called to declare the word of the Lord. And I, up until this moment, I didn't want to do it. And I remember having this moment where the Lord was like, here's your assignment. And that one moment, of course, didn't take me right where I am now. There were many steps in the process. Many steps in the process. But sometimes we can get caught up in even looking at some of the words that we've been giving and trying to step into this big thing when the Lord wants us to take the step in front of us. I remember as part of this journey, right after the Lord gave me this assignment, I got a prophetic word that was like, you're going to preach to 10,000. And so I'm like, whoa, Lord, like, I'm going to preach to 10,000. And so for the longest time, for the longest time, the Lord was, I was only looking towards, Lord, how do, I, how do I do a stadium gathering? How do we do this? Like, how do, we, how do we worship and take this to stadiums? And my heart was so in that. But my heart was so in that and began to get so caught up in the 10,000 when the Lord was like, I want you to step out and I want you to own your assignment now. And I don't know when I'll preach to 10,000. I'm still believing the Lord's going to do it. But right now, if he has me preaching to 200, that's amazing. I remember there was a Sunday just a couple moments back where the Lord took me full circle. And it was a moment where we had somebody come up here at the front and receive Jesus. I remember in that moment, I remember being like, Lord, this is why I do it. This is why I do it. It's not for the 10,000, it's for the one that comes forward in a moment that I didn't even want to preach the gospel. Honestly, I wasn't planning on preaching the gospel in that service. And for some reason, I felt prompted by the Lord to do it and one person comes forward. And do you know how many times I've given that presentation and no one's come forward? You've been in this room a lot. And do you know that I'm going to keep giving an invitation even if no one comes forward? Because the Lord has an assignment on my life. And it's, if it's for that one person on a Sunday morning, then I'm going to be all about that one person on a Sunday morning. But this is what the Lord has called me to. It's an assignment that I had to own. And now the Lord has me pastoring a church by his grace. I want you to know, though, something happens when you're obedient to the assignment that God has on your life. I don't know that I would be standing here if I didn't have that moment where the Lord was like, this is who you are. This is the assignment that I have for you. A few months ago, That one person that got saved just really revealed to me, this is, this is what I'm called to. This is my assignment. And it renewed a fresh purpose in me. Harvest isn't meant to fit one box. And I want to say something too. Part of your assignment is your testimony. And I want to encourage you, if you're not If you're like, I just don't think my testimony matters. Your testimony is deeply important. It doesn't matter what background you came from. Your testimony is important. I remember the first time I shared my testimony about finding freedom from pornography at a worship in the city event. When I did it not in a church service, like it was an out there service. And I felt so vulnerable. I was like, Lord, I don't want to do this. It's too vulnerable. And lo and behold, I get up there and I start to talk about it. And I feel freedom hit the room. And every single time I share that story, someone comes up to me after service and says, I need freedom. 
And it's a renewed thing in my heart that part of my assignment is my story. Part of my assignment is what the Lord has brought me through. Gives me authority to see something happen in a room. And so I begin to share vulnerably. This is what I found freedom from. And somebody comes up and they're like, man, I'm struggling. Would you pray for me? That moment right there is a moment where the Lord was like, this is part of your assignment. Your story and your testimony is part of your assignment because it's something that God has seared in your heart because it's what he's brought you through. What has he brought you out of that you can release others into? All right. Can we stand? I want to pray for some people this morning. As I was driving home on a Saturday... Yeah, you can go get your kids, bring them in the service. We're going to land. As I was driving home on Saturday, I was listening to the Gen Z for Jesus live stream. And I heard Lou Engle. And he's up there and he's talking about Mordecai raising up Esther. In his voice that only he can do. And he begins to say this. And as soon as he said it, He was talking about how Mordecai spoke into Esther. I immediately felt the Lord say, I want to give my people fresh assignment in this season. So here's what I want to do. If you need, if you're, if you know what your assignment is, but you need to be refreshed because you feel weary in the assignment, I want you to come forward. The second thing is this. If you don't know what your assignment is, and you're like, man, I, I know I'm called to something, but I don't know exactly what it is yet. I want you to come forward because I believe the Lord is going to give you a fresh assignment in this season for this moment. Some of you, you've been crying out to God with the question, what am I supposed to do in this season? What is my part of the harvest? I just feel like the Lord wants to release words that reveal the well, the word, and the woman. The where, the the word that he's put in your heart, and the who. And for those that are up here because of weariness, I just felt the Lord saying, keep going, keep sowing keep being obedient in the assignment so Lord we ask you for those that are up here Lord that are that have felt weary in their assignment I ask you that you would bring such a refreshment of purpose this morning that you would renew hearts Lord that you would renew a joy that there's a joy that comes in the midst of the assignment Lord whether that be teaching business whether that be family maybe it's raising kids in this season That the Lord wants you to see how important the assignment that you have is. So Lord, we ask right now that you would would renew hearts, that you would renew this fresh thing within them, Lord, that says this is the assignment that my heart burns for. And that you would, you would, even as it says in Isaiah, that you would allow them to, ride up on eagle's wings and run and not grow faint. So Lord, we break off weariness. We just ask you that you would renew a fresh purpose of assignment this morning. And then for those that are up here and you don't know what your assignment is, I want to pray for that. Lord, I ask you right now that you would you would reveal specific assignments, Lord. That you would reveal specific assignments in this season. Even as you revealed to Jonah that his call was to go to Nineveh. Moses was called to free the Israelites out of Egypt. I ask you that you would reveal specific assignments in this season, Lord, that you would reveal for some, maybe it's as big as a country, but for others, maybe it's as simple as, how do I step into the harvest in my business that I just started? How do I step into the harvest 
as a student in school. So Lord, I just ask you that you would download fresh assignment right now, right now. That where we've asked, what is my part in the harvest? What is my calling? Many of us were asking, what's our purpose? Lord, I thank you that you you have a unique purpose that you want to download to those that are that are asking for their assignment right now. We just ask you, Holy Spirit, that you would come, that you would mark hearts, that this would be a day, this would be a moment where we'd say, I left with an assignment. I left with a fresh assignment that I am part of the harvest. I am part of the harvest. tells you something that you don't like, write it down. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I ask you that you'd reveal the well, the woman, and the word, Lord. And Lord, we also as a church, we step in to the assignment to see the power of the Holy Spirit come out within us to be a witness. We step in, Lord, and we just say we want to see more, more of your power, more of your authority, Lord, to heal the sick, to cast out demons, to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living, to see the gospel go forth, to see people saved and set free. That this is a season as a church as we step into the end of this year and into 2024 that we say we will live on assignment to see a city transformed. We will see Fort Worth transformed. We will see the DFW Metroplex transformed. We will see those, some of you, you're not, you're watching from other countries online that you would see those countries transformed. We step in and we say the same thing that Jesus said. We're not gonna look up and we're gonna go, the harvest is four months from now. We're gonna look up and we're gonna say, the fields are white with harvest. It's time for harvest. It's time as a church to step in to a greater place of saying the harvest is now. And we're not just going to say send forth the laborers. We're going to say send me. Send me. I am sent. I am sent. I am sent. If you're part of this house, guess what? You are sent. Because we're going. We're going to the neighborhood. We're going to the streets. We're going. I saw something earlier this week in worship and we just kept saying yes and every time we said yes I saw doors beginning to open and I feel like this morning there's some of us like we don't you don't have to have it all figured out you just have to say yes and there have been times in my life when I've said yes to things that I couldn't see at all how it was ever going to happen it seemed complicated it seemed too far all the things and I just want to encourage you I just feel to encourage us say yes 
You don't have to have it all figured out. You don't know, have to know how it's going to happen, how God's going to provide for it. You don't have to know. You just have to show up. You just have to say yes and show up. So I just feel like even right now, I feel like it's important to do that. So just as you feel God leading you in that way, just say yes. Just say it out loud because our yes is going to open doors that but God is going to do supernaturally. Just say yes. Don't wait for the door to open. Say yes and the door is going to open. So, yes. That's good. Well, if you're up here, you can stay up here and just continue to pray. But we do get an opportunity to go out here right now and be part of our fall kickoff party over at Greenbrier right across the way here. So we're going to go ahead and we're going to end here watching online we're glad you joined us and I just I'm excited about what the Lord is going to do if you want to stay and linger up here at the front you're welcome to do that Uh, we love you the harvest is is ripe it's time let's step in together